By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim? Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And this is the last episode of 2021. It's Old Year's Day, but it's also a Friday, and that means Timmy Talks episode always, every single Friday. And uh, before I continue, I would just like to thank all of you for making Timmy Talks, just having a fantastic year, making my year personally as a creator of this channel uh, a perfect year as well. Thank you so much for all the view time, all the support, all the positive comments. You know, Timmy Talks is nowhere without the support of the fantastic old school community. So thank you very much for all your support this year in 2021. And I hope to also welcome you in 2022 because the Timmy Talks train just keeps on going. And um, I'm really happy that my last video of the year is also a personal highlight for me uh, in old school this year. It's one of the tournaments that um, wasn't canceled. A lot of events were canceled, but this tournament wasn't. And I just had so much fun. And then, of course, I'm talking about the Often Troll Cup, an amazing tournament that was held in Leowada. And this match is a round one match played in that tournament. And we're actually going to see Ron, who's playing with an ATOG deck, with Savannah Lines in there, so that's quite interesting. And he's the organizer also of the Often Troll Cup, and he's taking on Frank, and uh, Frank Rulofs to be precise, and he's playing with a line dip deck. And the interesting thing is that um, I've been told that Frank is a very experienced player, not in old school, but he is very experienced in playing Magic in general. He's done Grand Prix and all that stuff, all that fancy stuff, so he knows what he's doing. So this is going to be a really interesting first match, and I'm really looking forward to show it to you. Now, if you'd like to know more about the Often Troll Cup as a tournament, uh, I've placed a link to the Often Troll Cup uh, organizer in uh, the description below to his Instagram to be precise and to his Facebook page. If you want to know more, you can check that out. You can also check out a mail day video that I made actually dedicated to this tournament where I kind of go through what the tournament was all about. And of course, if you want to know more about the rule set and uh, other information, please check the description below. And in that description below, you can also find several timestamps like always. So for example, if you want to skip this introduction, you know, no worries. No offense taken, you can just click on the link MTG Games that will take you straight to the games. But you can also see the links, the timestamps, I should say, to the specific deck deck sections. So, you know, it's just really easy to browse in the video using those timestamps. Talking about deck decks, here we are going to continue with the deck decks, and I'm going to start with the deck of Frank. Let's take a look at his Line Dip Brew. And here we are seeing the deck of Frank Lion Dip. So it's white and it's blue and it's named after those two creatures, Savannah Lions and Surrendip Freet, hence the name Lion Dip. And those two creatures say a lot about the strategy of these decks. What you want to do when you play this is you want to get your Savannah Lions out, you know, turn one ideally. You want to get your Surrendip Freet out, turn two maybe with some extra Moxen or Soul Ring. And, you know, and then you just want to get as much damage in as possible. And you want to use those famous white and blue control cards to control the board. So you're going to control the board, make sure no creature hits the board, make sure your creatures stick, and then you can just swing in and deal damage. How are you going to do that? Simple, you've got disenchant, short supply shares, you've got, you know, uh, four counter spells in this deck. We also see two power sinks, which is quite interesting, and of course, a mana drain. So there's just a lot of control, and on top of that, we also see the two black cards, you know, the, the kind of boring cards, but the cards that are worth splashing, I guess. Uh, which is Mind Twist and Demonic Tutor. And we also see the blue power that's going to give you some extra gas when you're kind of running out of cards, right? You can get that extra turn to do that final combat swing and you can draw some cards with Ancestral Recall, but also Brain Geyser, of course, not being part of the Power Nine, but definitely a very strong card. And that can kind of help you when you're stuck like in this, in this dead end. Because, of course, the weakness of this deck is... If you're not able to put in a lot of damage at the start of the game, you're probably not going to win, you know? So that is really something that you have to do when you're playing with this deck. Um, when we're looking at the sideboard, by the way, uh, there are a few cards that I would like to highlight in this matchup, and that is the Blue Elemental Blast and also the Circle of Protection Red. You know, both of those cards are probably going to go in. I guess I'm almost 99% certain they're going to uh, go in after sideboarding because the opponent of Frank Ron is playing an ATOG build. So that means we're going to see uh, a lot uh, a lot of, of red 
power cards, a lot of red direct damage, but also of course the Atox themselves. So protection from red is pretty important and that's probably what Frank is going to do. Also, I'm expecting him to board in those mazes of if, because they're just ideal against Atox, right? You can say, you know what? You can sack whatever you want. I've got my maze, I can just send them back. Whatever, man, whatever. Anyway, this is the deck of Frank. Now let's take a look at the deck of his opponent, Ron. And here we see the deck of Ron. And the first thing that I notice are the four Atox there on the right top corner, right? This is really your Atox deck. And we see that Black Vice, Ankh of Mishra combination as well. And it's such a classic combo, right? Black Vice is a card just one to cast. You want to have that in your opening hand because it's like a free lightning bolt towards your opponent. So your opponent has to take damage for every card that he has in hand above four. So if your opponent has seven in hand, he has to take three damage. And this just goes really well with Atok because one of the problems with Black Vice is later in the game when your opponent has emptied his hand, which is probably going to happen because Frank's got a pretty quick deck, you know, your vice is just not going to be as useful. But when you've got an Atok, every dead artifact is like a mini giant grove. It's fantastic. You just put it on the board and whenever you like, you can sack it to the Atok and give it plus two, plus two. And, you know, the same thing can be said of Ankh of Mishra, you know, two to cast. And Ankh of Mishra is every time any player puts a land into play, he or she takes two damage. So that also includes yourself. Obviously, uh, when you're looking at this deck of Ron, he doesn't need a lot of mana. So he doesn't really care for lands. He doesn't need a lot of lands. And the nice thing is, again, Atok uh, can always eat the Ankh of Mishra in the rare situation where maybe you need to play out that land, but you cannot take that extra damage. You can always eat the artifact away and then play your land after. Another thing I really like is that combination uh, Black Vice, Ankh of Mishra, because the Black Vice is telling the opponent, you have to empty your hand as fast as you can. In order to empty your hand as fast as you can, you want to play out lands. But there's that Ankh of Mishra and you don't want to take that damage. Also, when you're playing against a red deck, you kind of know, I always have that in the back of my mind when I'm playing against a red deck. I don't want to go too low. Even when you're on nine against a red deck, I mean, the burn can be so brutal, you can get burned out. You're like, I want to stay at least on 10 life or, you know, preferably higher. Obviously, that's not always a matter of, of taking a choice. Usually there's just so much pressure. And when we're looking at this deck, we can see Ron has really chosen to uh, put extra pressure on board by going for Savannah Lions. And I'm a little bit surprised about this decision because, you know, there are three Savannah Lions in here. And for example, no Chain Lightnings. Chain Lightning would have been an interesting addition as well. One of the things that always annoys me about Chain Lightning, let me know in the comments below how you feel about that, is the fact that it's sorcery speed. And when you want to be as efficient as possible, it's just that Lightning Bolt is so nice. You can play it whenever, you can play it in combat, you can play it in the opponent's turn, you can play it on end step. But you know, with the Chain Lightning, it feels kind of like, uh, how can I say that, kind of slow, you know? You gotta wait for your main phase and you gotta play it. It's like very obvious when, when you play it. But nonetheless, it is three damage to any target and it would be, you see it in a lot of these a aggro ATOC builds. So what, what I find really interesting about this is that Ron has made a different decision and he said, you know what, I'm gonna go for the three Savannah lines. I think because he wants to get, you know, the lines out early and then maybe cast um, an Armageddon, you know, and then from there just deal damage with the line. The line, of course, is is perfect to for those early points of damage and Savannah Lines is also perfect if you want to do two things in a turn because Savannah Lines is only one white. So usually you can end cast Savannah Lines and do something else. And especially being able to cast that second spell can usually just give you that, that moment ahead you know, and just maybe the difference between being able to deal a couple of points of damage or not being able to do anything else at all. So that can be more valuable than you uh, might think. Looking at the rest of the deck and again, thinking of the Savannah Lions in the deck, uh, what I really notice here are the two Earthquakes. So, you know, Earthquake, of course, uh, one Retin X deals X damage to every player and every creature without flying. So that's going to be very difficult for the Lions to deal with. Um, but it's also a great way to deal those last points of damage to your opponent or when you're, for example, playing against uh, like a mono green deck. I know there are quite some mono green decks here uh, today in Leovarda. Uh, it's, it's, it's great with the Earthquake, right? It really wipes those decks. And, and what if you play against, I don't know, somebody playing with four Timmies? Who does that? But what if you play against a player like that? Then again, your Earthquake is golden. Um, I'm a little bit surprised, to be honest, to only see one Armageddon. I think this deck 
could be maybe even better with two Armageddons, but I don't know. Ron, if you're listening to this, let me know in the comments below. I do really like that inclusion of the one Armageddon. And of course, because it's Ron and because he's such a fan of the Often Troll, he's Mr. Often Troll, he's put, oi, 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 two Often Trolls in his deck. And there's actually a prize today for the player that, um, for the highest ranked player at the end of the of the day in the tournament who has Often Trolls in his or her deck. So you can actually win a prize by playing with often trolls here. Looking at the sideboard, um, just, just the thing I want to point out here is that second Armageddon. Also the city in a bottle, I'm expecting that to come in against the Serendips. And also the three uh, red elemental blasts are probably going to come in as well against all those all that blue violence of Frank. Okay, so we've talked about both of the decks. I think they're, they're pretty much top tier here. Let's go to the match and uh, see how this is going to end up. Let's go! Game number one here is about to begin. Ron on the right and on the left we see Frank. So Ron's playing Atok and Frank's playing a Lion Dip. So let's take a look. Ron on the player starting off well with who a double Mox. Wow. So Mox Jet, Mox Sapphire, and a Mistress Factory. Oh, oh my God. Jeez Louise. Dang. Frank's going to Pound Town, taking six damage without even starting, and at least he's got to turn one with his Havana lines. Oh man, Ancestral Recall. This is an insane first and second turn by Ron. And I mean, this is going to be super difficult for Frank. I kind of feel like he's already lost this first game and we haven't even started. Oh man, let's see what else Ron can do here. Four cards in hand after that Ancestral. And uh, is he going to play, for example, an Atok here? He's got the red mana for it with that uh, Volcanic Island. And at least Frank was able to play out two cards there with having to get turn uh, one Savannah Lines, which is actually not that bad for his deck. But I mean, against this opening, what can you really do? And there he's going to tap. Okay, Ank of Mishra. Oh, that's so bad. So now he's got that scenario going where Frank wants to empty his hand. How can you do that? You need Lance. But if he plays Lance, he's going to get punished for it by the Ankh of Mishra. That's exactly what's happening now. He's going to drop to eight. Going to attack for two here. So then I'm expecting him to maybe, you know, play a blocker. There's the Black Lotus. Is he going to crack it? He's probably want to play something to block that Mishra's uh, factory of Ron there. Yeah, he is going to crack it playing a Sarah Angel. This is actually not too bad. Frank has a pretty good start, but playing against the Double Vice and the Ank has set him back so much. Look at his life total already on eight. And I mean, all that Ron needs is just some burn to finish the game. He's got four bolts. He's got two side blasts. Are we now going to see an Atok here? It looks like he's a little bit in the tank. He has several options, perhaps. Going to go for the Atok. And pass turn here. There I see a Mox Jet there. And I think another Mishra's fact Factory, I believe, or not. There's the attack. That's kind of the no-brainer. 14 for Ron. There's the Mishra's Factory. He's going to go to 6 because of the Ankh. And there is the Mind Twist for 3. So there we see Ron losing 3 cards, including um, a Lightning Bolt. And I think that Lightning Bolt is going to have a big impact here. And what is he going to do? There we see a bolt on the Savannah lines. And now he's going to attack for two. And now Frank has to kind of block that Atok. And of course, Ron's going to feed him some artifacts. Remember, you can sacrifice an artifact to give the Atok plus two, plus two. And that's exactly what's happening here. Double Vice sec for plus four, plus four for the Atok, killing the Sarah Angel and dealing two damage there with the uh, Mishra's factory. And now we see Ron taking another card. Attacking here and already tapping that Mox Jet. That's kind of interesting that he did that. Um, there we see an, an animate and I'm expecting him now to feed the Jet. So that's going to be a 3-4. Then it's going to pump itself. So now it's a 4-4 Mistress Factory. So he has to sack another artifact to it if he wants to kill it. And I'm expecting him to do that because you don't want to lose your Atok here. So probably that Ankh of Mishra and the Mox Jet. Exactly. Ankh of Mishra and Mox Jet. Gonna kill the workshop here. Sorry, the factory, of course, not the workshop. There we see a balance. Oh, Frank. Wow, man. I have to say, I'm admiring your style, man. I thought you would be dead in a minute after the turn one and turn two of Ron. And look at this. You're still alive. There we see uh, an attack. So I guess he's gonna drop to four here. And... Um, 
yeah, there seems to be a little bit of a discussion about life totals. I, I, I think that uh, Frank is also keeping track of his own life totals outside of the dice. And he's saying somewhere we missed two damage. So now he's on two. Um, and there is another attack. Is this it? Oh, power sink. No, it's not it. He's still alive. Oh, what a game. What a game. And, oh, I can't believe this. Frank's still alive. Double power sink. And there is an Ankh of Mishra and a pass. And there's a pass again. So Ron really kind of top decking, trying to find some direct damage. And he's probably... Is he going to attack here? Taking two damage from his own Ankh. He's going to attack there. We see the activation. 3-3. Three, three, so they're going to trade. No, they're not. Because there is a Swords to Plowshares. And here you see what Frank's deck is really, really good at. And that is having answers to problems. Disenchant, Swords, Counter Magic. He's got so many answers. And let's see what Ron can do here. And okay, there's a Chaos Orb. So I'm expecting him to attack with the factory. And then Frank's going to animate. And he's probably going to flip on that factory. So there's the animate. He's going to attack. And there we see the uh, animation of the factory. And there's the flip. So let's see. Is this flip going to hit? If that's the case, then Ron's probably going to win this game. So let's wait for the flip here. And it's a hit. Very good flip by Ron. And oh! <laughs> Oh, look at Frank go. He's unstoppable, man. He doesn't want to die. He's like a cat in a corner. He's got nine lives. I mean, Ron is to find... Oh, okay, that's it. Side Blast, that's it. I guess he didn't have any counter magic left, but Frank, I tip my hat to you, sir. Fantastic how you managed to stay in this for that long. At a certain point, I thought, what, are you actually going to make a comeback here? Because after that turn one and turn two, I mean, how can you still still win that game? Anyway, uh, this is game number one, and now both players are going to sideboard, and I actually think that Frank, you know, has a small advantage after sideboarding with the COP Reds, uh, the Blue Elemental Blasts, and the Mazes of If. I think he stands a chance here, so we're going to let these players sideboard, and we'll catch back up with them in game number two. Game number two is about to begin here. That means that Frank's on the play now after losing that first one, and there we see Ron. He's taking a mulligan. It's going to go down to six. There's the opener of Frank. Pretty good opening. Tundra Savannah Lines and a Mock Jet. Let's see what Ron can do here. Playing a City of Brass. Tapping the city. Taking a damage. <laughs> oh, man. Again, finding an Ancestral Recall very early in the game. Maybe it's Ron's day. Maybe he's going to win his own tournament. Who knows? Playing a Mock Sapphire here and passing turn. That means he doesn't have to discard. There we see a Mox Emerald in attack. Are we going to see a Surrender? No, we're not. But it does mean that Frank now is double blue open. So he can start countering stuff. Remember, he's playing with four counter spells, two power sinks, and a mana drain. So that's seven pieces of counter magic. There we see a plateau by Ron. And he's tapping two. Ank? Yep, Ank of Mishra. Super annoying artifact that did so much work for Ron in game number one. And there's a pass turn. There is a Mishra's factory taking two damage from the Ank. And there's a Savannah Lines. Taking, or sorry, a lightning bolt. <laughs> there's also Savannah Lines, but I meant to say there's a bolt on the lion. So the lion is a goner here and a pass turn. What is Ron going to do? And at least it's looking a little bit better for Frank here. He's still up to 18. And Ron's actually lower in life on 16. And there he's playing a bronze tablet. And bronze tablet gives one um, damage during the upkeep of each player so whenever it's your turn you're going to take one damage during the upkeep and tapping two here for an atok and of course bronze tablet and atok goes together very well and here we see the life the damage that frank's taking gonna go down to 17 and is he gonna attack here interesting this is interesting he's gonna swing in does that mean that he has Maybe a sword. It's like he's hoping for Ron to block. Second artifact. And then he can respond by playing a sword. It's gonna... Yep, that's exactly what he's going to do here. And uh, that way Ron's actually losing an artifact and a creature instead of only a creature. And there's the time walks. It's looking pretty good for Frank here. He's got more control. It does mean one extra damage from the tablet. Absolutely right, Ron. So he's going to drop to 16. Five lands. Is he going to cast Sarah? Ancestral Recall. Okay, that's fair after the recall of Ron. Going to draw three more cards. Attacking for two here. Ron's going to drop to 13. I mean, he's still pretty high up, you know. And there he's playing a City of Brass as well. He's going to go to 14, playing Alliance. 
and passing turn here. And what can Ron do? Three cards in hand for him at the moment. Tapping two, there's another Atok. Atok is such an annoying creature to deal with. On the other hand, Frank has enough answers. He's gonna take a damage from the tablet again. Gonna drop to 13, so Ron's on 12, Frank's on 13. And Ron's up one game. That's the situation at the moment. He does have that factory, of course, that he can use. I wonder if he wants to swing in here. If he does, exactly. If he does, I think he's got some removal in hand. So there we see an activation of the factory. There we see a source. Interesting, before blocks are declared on the ATOC. And we see a disenchant here on the factory. And again, this is the strength of his deck, just having a lot of answers. And I can tell from experience, it feels so good to play with swords and disenchant. They're just so, so good in the removal department in old school. And now it's looking pretty bleak for Ron because Frank can uh, attack here with the factory and the lines, deal four more damage. Gonna put Ron to three. First he's gonna tap two, Demonic Tutor. Ooh, what is he gonna look up? Already played two pieces of blue power. I wonder what he's gonna do here. First he's gonna attack four, three, okay, Bolt? No, he doesn't play with Bolt, of course. He's gonna go to two from his own tablet, and that's it. He's saying, you know what, I can't win this. Ah, unfortunate. I always like it when they, like, finish the whole game. I get it when you're together at a table, and you're like, hey, I haven't found anything. You know, you've got this one. I get it. But it's always nice to see the full ending. Anyway, wow, what a game from, from Frank, and it's 1-1. And, yeah, it's this is really everybody's match. I'm really looking forward to game number three. It looks like these players are going to slightly adjust their decks again. So we're going to give them some time and we'll catch back up with them in the decider game number three. Game number three, the decider here. And Ron is on the play and that's why he's, in my book, a slight favorite. But it's really everybody's game here. And we see a good opener for him with his Savannah Lines turn one. And look at that. Frank, for the first time in this match, doesn't have a turn one Savannah Lines. And there's the attack, so that means Frank's gonna drop to 18 here. Can Ron do something in his second main? Oh, again, that Ang of Mishra. It has done so much work for him. And I'm sure after watching this game, you wanna start playing with Ang of Mishra yourself. There is a Swords on the Lions. And so we see Ron moving up to 22 because of that and a pass turn here. So he's not playing out a land. Interesting, I wonder, is he doing that because he doesn't have it? Probably, or because he doesn't want to take the damage. He probably doesn't have to land. There we see Disenchant on the Ankh. And he's passing turn here. Ooh, so he's got mana problems. But look at that. Ron's also not really finding anything. What an odd third game. We're in game one and game two. Both of these players will full on every single turn. Here we see them kind of taking it easy. There's a Circle of Protection. Red, a great card, of course, here. Ooh, Black Vice, even a better card for Ron. Because it means damage, and I believe he's got a full grip of cards. But there we see a power sink. So he's playing a power sink for one. And uh, I guess Ron can just pay, but of course he wants to empty his hand. It took me a moment to realize that. That's actually a good play, Frank. You want to empty your hand, of course. Taking damage from the vice, going to go to 17. Finding at least a land. There's a planes. Oh, disenchant on the Mox Sapphire. But there's a counter spell, and there is... A red elemental blast on that counter spell, so that means the mock sapphire is gone. And at least, you know, Frank got to empty his hand a little bit, no longer taking damage from the vice. And let's see if he can find some lands. No, he cannot. He's not really doing anything. I believe he now has five cards in hand, so he's probably going to take a damage. There we see an animate attacking here, and he's going to use it, but there is going to be a lightning bolt, perhaps? Yep, a bolt. And this bolt is really good for Ron. Oh, blue elemental blast! This is so important, this blue elemental blast by Frank here. Oh, psionic blast! That is a pity for Frank. There is a swords, though, and again, he's emptied his hand a lot, Frank. That's the only, like, silver lining of this exchange. There is a Savannah Lines by Frank. And let's see what Ron can do. We are playing a Volcanic Island and passing turn. There's the attack. Ron's going to drop to 18. And this is just a much slower game than uh, game number one and two. Very interesting. There's the Ankh of Mishra again. 
So Ankov Mishra Vice Combo is again on the table. And all that artifact damage, of course, is not affected by the COP Red. So Ron doesn't really mind that COP Red that much. There is a Mishra's Factory on the board for Ron. And what else can he do here? It looks like he wants to play out perhaps the Atok now. No, he's going to play out something bigger, it seems. He's going to tap. Okay, an Earthquake for one. So he can prevent the damage to himself. Oh, there's a Blue Elemental Blast. Red Elemental Blast. Wow. And here you can really see Blue Elemental Blast and Red Elemental Blast playing a big role. We didn't really see that in Game 2, but now in Game 3, it's like full on. There's that Maze of If coming from the sideboard as well for Frank. So he can use that, of course, to stop the Mishra's Factory. And look at that. I mean, you know, Ron's top decking at the moment. And three cards in hand, four cards in hand now. And passing turn. And Ron also passing. There we see Divine Offering on the Vice. That means an extra life as well here for Frank. He's going to play the basic island, so he's going to drop back again, drop to 13. And what can he do here? I thought maybe a Sarah Angel in hand, but no, no Sarah Angel for Frank. I believe he's playing two main. We also haven't seen any Surrendips for Frank. Perhaps he boarded those out because playing against like such an aggro deck as Ron and playing with Surrendips can be kind of risky because you're also hurting yourself, of course, with the Surrendip. So I wonder if we boarded those out. Maybe, Frank, if you're listening to this, maybe you can let us know in the comments below. There we see an ATOG by Ron here. And, of course, he's got the COP Red for the ATOG. He's got the Maze for the Mishra's Factory. So he's really not that concerned. It's still everybody's game here. There is... Ooh, Chaos Orb. This is kind of a big deal. He's going to activate. And then the question is... Does Frank have a disenchant here to respond? It looks like he does not. He can actually now use the COP Red, I believe, to prevent the upcoming damage from the ATOG, at least for this turn. But he's not doing that. I believe that's something that he can do. And it looks like now he's going to take the damage from the ATOG. The question is, how many artifacts is he going to sack? He can sack a lot. But remember, I mean, Frank's deck is filled with, uh, with swords. And that's probably why Ron is saying, I'm first sacking this. Do you want to respond? Uh, no, I do not. I'm not going to sack this. Do you want to respond? And now we see that sword to Plowshare. So that means that Ron's going to gain three life here. Going to go up to 16. And the moment that I saw Frank choosing to send the factory back, I kind of knew, okay, he's got to have a swords. And there we see a Sarah Angel on the board. But we also see a side blast here from Ron. That's the perfect answer. And also because Frank was stepped out, he couldn't protect the Angel with counter magic. Wow, what a thriller this Game 3 is. It can still go both ways. And there is a Mind Twist for 2. And there's a Bolt on Frank. Gonna drop to 8. And he's just gonna lose a Volcanic Island. There's a Time Walk. Oh, man. There's another Sarah Angel. And, you know, Ron stop decking. He's already played, I believe, two Psionic Blasts. Ooh, Ron's gonna drop to 10. Ron has to find an answer to the Sarah soon. He's on a three-turn clock at the moment. There we see Demonic Tutor. Is he going to look up an Ancestral Recall here? Just going to draw three more cards. That's definitely an option. I wonder what he's going to do. Or is he going to choose to find another Counterspell to protect his Sarah Angel? That could be an interesting option as well. There we see an Atok. And there we see a pass. There he's going to attack. He's going to drop to six. Six for Ron, eight for Frank. It's looking really good for Frank. I wonder what he looked up with the demonic. Is it going to be a counter spell? And Ron still needs an answer. He's probably going to attack here with both. There's a vice. Only attacking with the Atok. Why is he blocking here? Why not just maze it? He's got that maze. I'm really surprised here by this, this choice. And now he's sending it back. Okay, so he's blocking it. And before damage is dealt, he's sending it back. That is actually really clever, Frank. Oh, man, that is a very good move. I didn't think about that at all. There's the attack with the Sarah. Ron dropping to two. Is Frank going to win this one? He's just passing first. Ron's got one more turn to deal. No, Frank's won it. Oh, I'm kind of surprised, to be honest. Man, what a match.
And this is just the first round of the Often Troll Cup. So if you've enjoyed this as much as I did, then you're probably gonna come back uh, next week because then I've got more uh, magic for you from the Often Troll Cup. Oh man, and I've got good news if you like this because we've got four or five more videos all the way up to the finals with matches from the Often Troll Cup held in Leeuwarden. Oh, wow, what a match. Uh, all I can say really is um, thank you for watching and have a wonderful New Year's Eve, man. Um, make it great. I hope you had a great th 2021. I know for a lot of people the year wasn't easy, but uh, we're gonna go up to the new year and I'm, I'm sure things are gonna change for the better. Anyway, uh, I really enjoyed this year from a magic perspective, uh, that is, you know, wow. And this tournament was just fantastic. Anyway, uh, thank you very much for watching uh, this episode right here on Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And uh, if you're new to the channel, welcome. I'm very happy to have you here. Please consider subscribing and ring that bell. All that really helps. And if you've been here before, if you're a returning customer, I should say a returning viewer, thank you, man. Thank you for sticking around. Um, please consider leaving a like. That really helps if you like this content. Leaving a comment and sharing this on your socials. All that helps the channel grow and helping me continue making content for you. Talking about that, you can also become a sponsor of the show. And how does that work? It's actually quite simple. There's an info card popping up right now. Click on that info card and that will take you to the Timmy Talks Patreon page where you can read all about becoming a patron of the channel. It already starts with $1. And the cool thing is when you become a patron, you're supporting the channel financially, but you also have access to the Timmy Talks Discord. We can even make an episode together and also your name will be mentioned in the end scroll. So if that sounds interesting to you, click on that info card and have a look at the Timmy Talks Patreon page. And for now, we are going to continue to the end scroll and we're gonna take a look at the fantastic, amazing channel members and patrons of Timmy Talks. Here we go to the end scroll. Ik het dus, ik het dus, zomba kazee.